What'd you think? You liked it. You also liked it. Great. You can... <laughs> So this is our second to last backyard show. And boy, are my arms tired of quickly throwing away all the takeout containers so the people who work on this show don't see how I live. That, I also just, we've had a, we've had a bit of a night here. When you decide you're going to start doing a live show, and by the way, my parents, for those watching on YouTube, my parents are here. We'll deal with them. Well, they're here for one segment. And that's it. But when you say, let's do a live show in your backyard, you think, what could go wrong? And I have to say, it was very surprising to find out that the sewer line to the city was backed up. And and we had a, <laughs> we had a sewer leak in my backyard that I had to clean up before this show began. I snuck out the front door, put on rubber gloves and a garbage bag and cleaned up a bag of backed up sewage so that when you arrived, you wouldn't think, huh, is this the right place? It smells of human shit. <laughs> and the point I want to make is, starting in March, we are back at the Dynasty typewriter. <laughs> and you can get tickets at crooked.com slash events, and we'll be all over the country, and I can't wait to see you. It was also lovely to be uh, in my gloves picking up the detritus from Los Angeles' sewers, and to look over and see Ari taking photos, I, I guess for socials. Maybe the episode art? My parents are in town, as I mentioned, and staying with me, so we couldn't not have them on the show. Here they are, look at them, they have one mic to share. <laughs> and what better way to incorporate them into tonight's episode than to have them judge these monologue jokes. Uh, hello mother, hello father. Here, you should use the mic. There's one for you. There are two. No, you're just talking. Hello, Hello mother. Jonathan. Hello. Hi, father. <laughs> Hello, Jonathan. Uh, mom and dad each have paddles. One says, love it. The other says, leave it. Uh, <laughs> and as we go, they're going to uh, rate the jokes. Uh, for those listening, I'm sure I'll comment on it. Mother, you ready? I'm ready. You got to talk? What do you I'm ready. Okay. Ready. Ready. Great. Terrific. Let's get into it. What a week. Today, California revealed their new plan for entering the endemic phase of COVID-19. Unfor <laughs> Unlike the plumbing in my house, California is getting back to normal. <laughs> see, I see there's an advantage to this new process where we have it on screen. You can make these last minute little additions. Said Governor Gavin Newsom, we have all come to understand what was not understood at the beginning of this crisis, that there is no end date, that there is not a moment where we declare victory. No end date, no moment of victory. That's what we call a Democrat hurrah. So it will be less of a ticker tape parade in Times Square end of war and more chasing an A-130 while it takes off from Kabul kind of war. That was a tough one. That was tough. <laughs> Elsewhere in the country, Montana's former Republican governor, Mark Rassicott, rebuked Trump's election fraud claims, Mark Rassicott did, in an op-ed in the Billings Gazette, declared Rassicott, there is not even a scintilla of evidence anywhere to support such piffle. Rassicott continued, which is why today I'm proposing this far more valid rationale for hanging Mike Pence. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thanks, Paul. <Bobby. laughs> that killed. What do you think? You leave it? Love, love, love it. it. Love it. Terrific. <laughs> Meanwhile, Josh Hawley is officially selling mugs illustrated with his January 6th fist in the air. It's not a pro-riot mug, the senator told the Huffington Post. I like a mug that you have to explain. A mug that says, this is not the mug of an insurrectionist, to be clear. It's very embarrassing. Anyway, if you're gift shopping, it's a great way to say, I'm sorry your grandkids blocked you on Facebook. <laughs> Speaking. Great. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Speaking of dangerous addled movements, I don't know about you, but I have been neck deep in Freedom Convoy news recently, and I wanted to visually break down my thoughts about these protests because I think there's been a lot of, like, it's civil unrest, and I want to visually break down, Hallie's going to join me on stage with a chart that breaks down the protests based on how righteous and disruptive they are, and we're just going to see where the Freedom Convoy <laughs> ranks. So here's what we have, all right? This is disruptiveness, and this is righteousness. 
you want to be up there or down here, okay? But you don't want to be down here, all right? And you really don't want to be up here either. You know what I mean? You guys get it. All right. Protesters shut down the 101 during George Floyd protests. That is righteous and disruptive, like a freedom convoy, you know? That's okay. They will do that one. I mean, it's not even that disruptive, to be honest. It's just righteous and a little annoying, you know? In a good way, for justice. <laughs> See, then you have an anti masker screaming at a Starbucks cashier. And for the people in the Starbucks, that's very disruptive and not righteous, right? So that goes, how does this work? It goes up here. Actually, I think it's like not that disruptive. So it kind of goes like here. <laughs> The women of Athens withholding sex in 411. It's a year. It's a year. I know. <laughs> I know. It's a year to end the Peloponnesian War. I bet it was pretty disruptive. I, f I don't know much about the Peloponnesian War, but I think it's good to withhold sex to stop a war. So we're going to call it very <laughs> great. Ew, don't be gross. You're both being gross. No, don't use your paddles if sex is disgust. <laughs> um, and we're going to call this one righteous... And not really that disruptive. Here, you can put, the, I'll put that there. Which brings us to the Freedom Convoy. We're going to end with the Freedom Convoy, which we we're going to say was maximally disruptive and completely not righteous. So it goes in the corner. All right. And that's all I wanted to say about that. <laughs> Anyway, the first season of Friends is back on Chinese streaming platforms with Chinese fans flagging censors edits, including the fact that Ross's ex-wife Carol, with whom he has a child, is a lesbian, as well as multiple mentions of sex and Joey going to the strip club. Some of these edits are shocking, but more shocking are the episodes they left up, including the one where Chandler frees Tibet. Could China be any more free and ascendant? <laughs> That's in the show. Yeah, there you go. It's a, you know, sarcasm, invented, friends, 1994. Conservatives freaked out this week over Biden's free crack pipes after the Department of Health and Human Services announced that the federal grant for a local drug rehabilitation program was aimed at harm reduction, which includes clean needles and safe smoking kits. You leave it? You love it? All right, Tucker Carlson over here. Put that down. <laughs> Conservatives, of course, are offended because it doesn't adhere to supply-side economics. The best way to get people to smoke crack is to create a yawning chasm of misery. Give a person a crack pipe and they'll smoke it for a day. Teach someone that life is pointless, that there's no help, no opportunity, that the good parts of life aren't for them and no one cares and that all paths out are closed. They'll smoke crack for the rest of their lives. Wanda Sykes, Amy Schumer, and Regina Hall will host this year's Academy Awards, which sounds cool. I'm into that. Every year, the Oscar host is like unacceptable no matter who it is. <laughs> but I actually think that sounds great. And they're great hosts to be out there, not just because they're uh, uh, very funny, but also I think they'll be good in a crisis when Don't Look Up sweeps and P.T. Anderson takes hostages. <laughs> <laughs> On Monday, a judge tossed out Sarah Palin's libel lawsuit against the New York Times, saying Palin's lawyers had failed to provide sufficient evidence proving the paper had acted with malice. What's cool is the judge actually sent the jury off to deliberate and then dismissed it and said, no matter what happens, this is over. The Times has won. But I still am curious what the jury's going to do. So I'm going to let them decide, too. And then the jury came back and said, we still agree with the Times. We agree with the Times as well. So then the jury sided with the Times, which is like the judicial equivalent of like walking away before something explodes behind you. He was like, case dismissed, throws the match, walks away, boom. I think that's cool. Anyway, a spokesman for the Times said in a statement, justice has been served and we are glad to have been protected against this scurrilous lawsuit by a known school shooter and lesbian. And lesbian was a late addition. And I actually think important, I think it was important. Uh, because it's interesting, just, it's interesting that it's both something very, very bad that you don't want to be and just something that's incorrect. <laughs> and that they're put together in some way. I think just saying school shooter was boring and expected. I do think it would have been funnier. What'd you think? You liked it. You also liked it. Great. You can... <laughs> An alleged drunk woman riding a motorized wheeled suitcase led police on a low-speed chase through the Orlando airport. The cop was corralling this inebriated person out of the airport until she spat at him, at which point he arrested her. This is Orlando, lady. The city loves for people to be drunk while waiting for a ride. You just can't spit. It's the only fucking rule <laughs> about drunk waiting. It's the only rule. And finally, Shailene Woodley and Aaron Rodgers have called off their engagement and broken up. Reports, aw, reports say Aaron has cold feet, a troubling symptom of long COVID. Hey. 
Hey, give it up for Fran and Robert, huh? Last week, our producer Kendra pulled back the diaphanous bedazzled veil on Olympic figure skating. And oh, God, so much more has happened in just the last week. Here to give us an update on the ice cold world of the games. Welcome back to the show, Kendra James. Hi, Pundit. <laughs> now, before we begin, Kendra, before we do love or leave it live or else, um, there's a ritual where, where I see if people want coffee and there's a delicate negotiation people do with themselves. Am I tired? Yes, but it's six o'clock. What happens if I have coffee now? And so the orders tend to look something like small coffee or small iced coffee to find the delicate balance between uh, being alert for this show and being able to sleep. I've been here for that. I've seen. And you said, get me a chai latte, add four shots of espresso. Correct. (laughs) Which is the closest thing I think Starbucks makes to jet fuel. (laughs) Why is it that you, at this moment, uh, required such a jolt? So um, I went to bed last night at around 9.30, and then I woke up at 3.30 mm-hmm. uh, to go to the bathroom ostensibly. But instead, <laughs> I sat down on the couch and started watching figure skating. And how many hours of figure skating did you watch? Uh, well, so I missed the first hour and a half, so I missed... <laughs> yeah. So I missed uh, the first sort of uh, one and a half groups. But then I watched from 3.30 until 6.15, 6.30. Nice, nice. So ladies skating wrapped up. Uh, what were the results? What happened? And why is all I'm seeing online pictures of sobbing and shell-shocked teenage Russian girls? Yeah, so uh, it was... I have not experienced emotion like this watching figure skating uh, since the Kerrigan incident. And by the Kerrigan incident, I do mean when she was um Yeah, we know. We know. There's only one. There's yeah. No, yeah. yeah. The... the <laughs> The time she didn't do as well as she thought? No, that we're t- <laughs> we know the time. When you say the Kerrigan incident, there's the one. Yeah. Um, and, and I mean that like genuinely, like watching this this morning was wild. So basically what happened was uh, I discussed last week uh, a Terry Tuberitze's girls who came to the Olympics from Russia and um, the girl, Camila Valieva, who was expected to easily take first place and she was in first place after the short program. Not unexpectedly, she really crumbled under the pressure of um, the ensuing investigation being uh, suspended and then unsuspended. And she started her program with a triple axel, fell, and then couldn't hit a jump basically for the rest of the program. So her teammate, um, Trusova, uh, Sasha Trusova, landed five quads. They weren't pretty, all of them, but she landed five quads uh, in her program. And then her other teammate, uh, Anna Shabakova, got the gold with two quads and a triple-triple uh, combo. And when it was announced that Sherbakova would take the lead over Trusova, Trusova broke down on television. Uh, this was live on NBC this morning. And she literally, she started, it, I, I hesitate to call it a tantrum because I feel like that's rude to these teenage girls who are under like such a, a massive amount of pressure. But she was uh, yelling, I hate you at my coach. She was yelling, I hate you at her, at the judges. She was yell- just screaming, wanted to refuse to go onto the medal podium because she was so upset that she got a silver medal despite landing the five quads. Um, and that's because uh, for an Atari student, silver is loss. That is just, that's not, you have not achieved anything if you got a silver medal. Um, and meanwhile, <laughs> For me, what will be the enduring image of the Olympics was uh, Anna Sherbakova sitting in the kiss and cry alone. She won the gold. She won the gold. Um, she was sitting in the kiss and cry alone. No coach, no no choreography staff, no one coming over to like congratulate her, embrace her, help her uh, through the sea of emotion that was coming from Trusova and Valieva, who was sobbing. And Valieva, when she got off the ice, the first thing Atari said to her was, why did you miss that? It, it roughly translated from Russian. I'm sorry. Uh, why, <laughs> why, why did you miss that triple axel? You let it go after all of that. Tell me why you let it go. No comfort. And this is the person who got the silver. This is the per- this is no. She came in fourth. Uh, oh, she, oh, that was the person who came in fourth. Yeah. Why was no one? It ha- was she not supposed to win the gold? Was that like? Was- so it was going. Everyone thought it was going to be a podium sweep. Um, and I should mention that came in third was Kaori Sakamoto from Japan, who's a beautiful skater. And she deserved uh, what she got. And she deserved higher component scores than the Russian girls. But judging is a little biased in figure skating. And um, so she didn't get those, but she did come in third. And so she actually, Kaori, 
was kind of the person who had to hold the whole thing together. I mean, she was the only one who wanted to be on that podium stand. She was thrilled to have gotten bronze. And you could see her sort of trying to inch closer to all the Russian girls, like maybe like make these photo ops work. But those two girls were just like, it was just a mess of emotion. And no, no adult in the room was doing anything. So this is because you're one thing you talked about last week is that this is a very abusive coach and an abusive situation that these these are these are kids that yes. they're in and is one of the reasons that it would be so, that she would be upset for landing five quads and not getting the gold is that she won't be able to do quads in the future i mean i think she might know that uh, subconsciously but what it really is is so she's been competing for quite some time now and she has watched her other teammates she said this again roughly translated from russian um she's watched her teammates get golds get golds uh, throughout her life and she's never gotten one um, and I think she was told by a Terry that if you land those five quads you don't have to work on any other part of your skating not your artistry not your skating skills nothing if you land those five quads you will win um, and then she didn't win and so there was a lot of disappointment to try to overcome but the coaching environment that she works in and the training environment that she comes from I don't think that she's ever been really taught to process those emotions of loss uh, properly. And so one thing that we talked about was that the Olympics ends and they all go to the next round of tournaments that the world's whatever, mm -hmm. and that that's in about a month. It seems as though between the scandal around the uh, 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 drugs yeah. and then basically just this attention to the fact that like these kids are doing these quads because they're in abusive situations. What ha what do you think sh needs to happen between now and a month from now, the next time these athletes all gather? So I think there's a few things. I think one thing that the ISU and the IOC, so the ISU again is the skating union uh, globally and then the IOC is the Olympic Committee. One thing that I think needs to happen is that the skating age minimum or the age minimum for competition in the Olympics needs to be raised to 18. Um, children should not be necessarily competing in, in the Olympics and that will help curtail some of the abuse. Um, another thing that Atari just needs to, Atari uh, teaches or coaches at a, a um, school called Sambo 70, which is um, in Moscow and I believe Sochi. And that whole organization needs to be investigated. And I think the ISU is considering doing that. But the thing is, if they do too much investigation, and I think that maybe they know this, they do too much investigation into Atari and they find out that obviously Valieva had possibly have been doping, if they find out that her other students had been doping, they might have to strip medals back all the way to 2014. And one thing that you had said is part of the problem is like they're coaching these girls to do these quads, which are very punishing on the body yeah. and uh, uh, cause them to basically it's something that they're doing when they're very, very young, that, mm -hmm. it, that it hurts their bodies and then they won't be able to compete much longer. Yeah. Is there anyone talking about stopping the like getting the quad out of female competition? It's been called for. I don't know that actual skating organizations are calling for it as of yet. Um, Alyssa Liu, who is an American skater who competed this year, um, she skated beautifully. She's 16 years old, and she always she had a triple axel at I believe 13, and she was uh, one of the first. She was the first American lady I believe to have a quad. She lost the quad when she went through puberty, and she accepts that. She knows that's normal. Her body changed. She grew a few inches um, and she could no longer do the few, the, those things anymore. And she was just like, I'm going to compensate for that by working to regain my triple axel and also like improving just my skating skills in addition to the technical score. And so you can bring up your component score to sort of compensate a little bit for the tech stuff, which is what Kaori did, who came in third. Um, and so she just just like, I'm going to work on that. And her coaches said, we're going to work on that. So I think that needs to be the focus. There is the technical and really impressive athletic abilities that come with skating. But the artistry also needs to be focused on. Right. Is it, or I guess is it, I don't even know how it works. But like, you just don't need to give points. They get they get it. And right now they're currently getting rewarded for yeah. quads. And so that's the other thing. The ISU uh, scoring system changed after the scandal in Salt Lake City. Uh, we won't go into that. But <laughs> <laughs> now, um, yeah, you get a base value for different types of jumps. So there really is an incentive to do those. And then you'll notice that the Russian girls always do their quads with their arms over their heads. Uh, and that adds to the value of how challenging the jumps are. Um, but to do those really well, you have to do this pre-rotation thing before you get off the ice, which means you're basically rotating your body around before you're getting up off the ice. And that's what leads to all the back injuries.
And I can tell you that from experience. <laughs> um, so that, like, that's the other thing that's like really ripping them apart. Uh, so yeah, they shouldn't be doing these jumps. And that's another edition of our <laughs> very dark, depressing Olympic figure skating update on the ongoing <laughs> terrible situation involving the Russian figure skating team. Uh, something we have now, uh, I think, done more coverage of than virtually any other outlet <laughs> in the English-speaking world. Certainly and, any other political comedy outlet. And definitely, yeah, <laughs> won't find this on Chapo. Uh, <laughs> Kendra James, everybody, thank you. Thank you.